What's going on, boys? It's Salted Neos here. Now that we have the Indigo Disc, it's finally time to finish answering the question, how many shiny Pokedex entries can we register in Pokemon Home? Be sure to watch part 1 for more context on which entries we currently have and the rules we're doing this under. Before we continue though, I've gotten some comments on things that I want to address, plus there's also some things that changed now because of the Indigo Disc being out. First things first, I forgot to mention the other gender of Pyroar and Unpheasant not counting for entries. So yeah, that's two things you don't have to scan. Secondly, I didn't mention that you can just skip scanning Execute completely. There's a trainer in the Pokemon Centers in I think Pony Island in the Gen 7 games who always has a shiny Execute. Which means that seeing it will be the same as scanning it. Because no matter what you do, it's registered as being seen in the Pokedex. You can also obtain a shiny Munchlax and Blitzel in the Scarlet and Violet DLC through a gift for beating the Ogre Outs minigame and through a League Club trade respectively, which enables skipping their QR codes. Similarly, shiny Ponyta is required to be caught for a request in Legends Arceus and is guaranteed to spawn as a result, meaning you can skip scanning Munchlax, Blitzel, Zebstrika, Ponyta, and Rapidash if you wanted to. I suggest skipping Munchlax's scan for reasons we'll get to. There's a few Pokemon I didn't bring up, either postponing or skipping the shiny dex entry for. I won't be going into specifics, but if I mention needing to catch a Pokemon that we already would have scanned, it's safe to assume they can be skipped. A lot of this applies to certain starter Pokemon, but cases of these Pokemon will of course not be added to the total. So if I say for example we need to catch a Bulbasaur, only Venusaur, Mega Venusaur, and Gigantamax Venusaur will be added to the total, since I added Bulbasaur and Ivysaur last time through scans. The last thing I need to discuss before we get started is related to how we go about registering entries. Now that we're in the era of the games that can withdraw Pokemon from home, we need to deposit a Pokemon during every stage of their evolution line and in all forms that can be deposited. Unlike when transferring from Pokemon Bank, Pokemon Home doesn't count the Pokedexes of Switch games when you withdraw or deposit things to it. So it takes a little more effort here unfortunately to get your shiny dex entries. So if you were to get a shiny Scorbunny for example, you would need to deposit it as a Scorbunny, withdraw it, evolve it into Rabu, deposit it again, withdraw it again, then evolve it into Cinderace. Once you have Cinderace though, you can do the Max Mushrooms before depositing it again to get both Cinderace and Gigantamax Cinderace. Of course, you'll only get the Gigantamax entry if your Cinderace is able to Gigantamax right now. Now that all that's out of the way, let's get started with something I didn't think we'd be saying, but it's actually a QR code to scan in the Ultra games. I made a whole video about this recently, but long story short, I was technically wrong about Dusk Lycanroc not being scannable, and I have made a QR code which properly scans in as Dusk Lycanroc, which is on screen now. So, one more to the total. If you want more details on this, check out that video, it explains how we got to this point, and why despite being able to generate QR codes now, we're only getting one more entry from it. Now we're going to move on to what we expect to start the video with, the required catches of Pokemon Sword and Shield. Because Sword and Shield doesn't show you for Pokemon Shiny in the overworld, we're going to want to keep anything we catch in this game to the absolute minimum. This will result in a few Pokemon having to be transferred back here later on to evolve into their Galarian forms or gain Gigantamax Factor, but overall this would be a lot easier to do than it would be to just hunt those Pokemon in Sword and Shield. Especially if the Pokemon is in Scarlet and Violet. Starting off with the Shinies you'll want to catch in the wild or breed, you'll want to hunt for a Shiny Galarian Ponyta, Galarian Darumaka, Galarian Stunfist, Blipbug, Nicket, Gossifleur, Wooloo, Yamper, Sizzlipede, Plavapus, Galarian Zigzagoon, Galarian Corsola, Galarian Farfetch'd, and Galarian Yamask. You'd most likely have an easier time dealing with Galarian Meowth here than you would in Scarlet and Violet as well, but if breeding is your preference, feel free to breed that one in whichever game you prefer. I'll be counting it here regardless though, as I'd rather do pretty much anything else than breed in Generation 9. If you know how to do Raid Den RNG, that's probably your overall fastest option, especially if you can get multiple of these in one den. It would allow you to get a lot of Gigantamax entries from the Event Den, or potentially some of the Pokemon I haven't even mentioned here if they overlap with some of the previously mentioned ones. I won't count that as the method to use for those Pokemon though, as I know not everyone's fond of RNG abuse. Or even for people like me, who like doing RNG abuse, but think Raid Den RNG is super tedious. Regardless of how you deal with these Pokemon though, they all need to be evolved into their respective evolutions, and in the case of Orbeetle and Centiscorch, given their Gigantamax factor to get those entries as well. Darmanitan doesn't seem to need Zen Mode to get the entry for Galarian Zen Mode, so it's two entries for that one regardless of ability. You might notice I've skipped over Galarian Weezing and Mr. Rhyme. Don't worry, we're coming back to those two, getting their pre-evolutions is easier in other games. 
We're not quite done with Wild Encounters yet, though, as there are three more which we have to get here that don't appear in any of the other games we'll be using. Those three are Butterfree, Kingler, and Garbodor, which all need to be given Max Mushrooms to get their Gigantamax entries in addition to getting their own entries. Butterfree and Kingler can be chained in Let's Go if that's preferable, which honestly would still be easier than using Sword and Shield for them, but Garbodor you have no choice but to get here or in an older game. In addition to the Pokémon I mentioned here, a few Pokémon can't breed and aren't in the wild, which unfortunately makes them immune to the Shiny Charm. The Galar Fossil Pokémon Dracozolt, Arctozolt, Dracovish, and Arctovish are all gift Pokémon, and as a result, that prevents them from being affected by the Shiny Charm. Even the alternative being Raid Dens is also unaffected by the Shiny Charm, and that's really not appealing unless you're willing to do Raid Den RNG. The two Galar Regis, Regieleki and Regidrago, also need to be hunted now. They aren't shiny locked, which is weird because they're new to these games, but due to whatever stupidity Game Freak did when they implemented them, they're unaffected by the shiny charm. The last thing we want to do in Sword and Shield for the moment is get some Pokemon from Dynamax Adventures. The Gen 7 legendaries that can appear in Dynamax Adventures are not shiny locked, so for the first time, that means Tapu Koko, Tapu Lele, Tapu Bulu, Tapu Fini, Solgaleo, Lunala, and Necrozma can finally be shiny hunted. Unfortunately, the gift Cosmog is still shiny locked, so no Cosmog and Cosmom shiny entries for us, unless by some miracle someone figures out the other private keys for QR codes to be generated for them. Dialga and Palkia can also be shiny hunted here, but I think this is significantly worse than just doing them on Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, since you need to do an entire Dynamax adventure every time you do one reset, despite the higher odds on paper. The Keldeo encounter in Crown Tundra is also still shiny locked, unfortunately, so the QR code is mandatory for the shiny entry for its two forms. Shiny locks also apply to all new legendaries in these games that aren't the Galar Regis. I think it's noteworthy that Solgaleo and Lunala unlock the shiny entry for Duskmane and Donling's Necrozma when deposited, even if you don't have Necrozma's shiny entry registered. Ultra Necrozma only registers when you have Necrozma's entry, though. With all these registered, we're sitting at 1,071 Shinies registered after our trick to Sword and Shield. Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl are not helpful to this challenge unless you really want to ignore QR scans and have to hunt Arceus there, which is great because those games are terrible. So we can move on to the first actually good Pokemon game of this video, Pokemon Legends Arceus. While knowing if you found a Shiny in this game is a lot easier than Scarlet and Violet thanks to the sound effect, I'll still try to minimize the Pokemon we need to catch in the wild here. Since even at the best odds, it's still easier to encounter a shiny in Scarlet and Violet thanks to sandwiches. I would have argued it's probably easier to get White Stripe Basculin here due to the sound effect, but Basculin flees so easily that even if you find one, you'll be lucky to get it in the battle. Speaking from experience here. Either way, getting the specific outbreaks you want in Arceus is really time consuming, and even ignoring that, outbreak encounters are predetermined in this game, making Scarlet and Violet superior by allowing you to just use the one outbreak and reset the encounters. There aren't actually that many Pokemon we need to catch in this game. The ones we want to catch here are any member of the Machop line, Mime Jr., Hisuian Growlithe, Hisuian Voltorb, Hisuian Sneasel, and Hisuian Zorua. The missing Hisuian forms and Hisuian Evolution Pokemon are caught in Scarlet and Violet, with a few coming back here to evolve. The Mime Jr. caught here will be sent to Sword and Shield to evolve into Galarian Mr. Mime, as it's easier to catch Mime Jr. here than it would be to get Mr. Mime in those games outside of Raid Den RNG. Additionally, the member of the Machop line should be evolved into Machamp, then sent over to a Galar game to get Gigantamax Factor for two more entries as well. Of course, if you find any of the other Hisuian Pokémon shiny during this, or their pre-evolutions, that's great, it makes your life easier, but these are the ones that are best to get here. Due to its shiny lock here, Enamorous and its Therian form are currently impossible to register shiny, leaving us with 1,083 Pokémon registered after leaving Pokémon Legends Arceus. Finally, we're on to the Scarlet and Violet portion of the run, which is where the majority of the Switch era Pokémon come from, to no one's surprise. We're starting out with not the Wild Encounters, actually, but a guaranteed shiny gift Pokémon, which is extremely relevant, the Munchlax I mentioned earlier. If you recall, I suggested skipping the Snorlax scan in the last part, because Gigantamax Snorlax is a required dex entry. I wasn't aware of this Munchlax gift, or I would have also said to not scan Munchlax either. This gift Munchlax should be transferred to Sword and Shield as is, to get around having to deposit an extra time, then evolved in the Galar game and given Max Mushrooms in Galar to get the entries for its entire line. I'm shocked no one brought this up in the comments of that video, but then again, this gift is kinda remote. I knew it existed, but not the fact that it was a shiny. Unfortunately, the Blitzel trait isn't as useful, but it's still there if you want to skip the scans. Next up is the meat and potatoes of Scarlet and Violet, the standard Wild Encounters. 
We'll start off with the encounters we skipped in previous games, since a few of them evolve into Paldean Pokemon themselves, so I think starting with these ones would make things a little easier to deal with once we cover those. First off for the ones we skipped before, the Pokemon that need to be sent back to Sword and Shield at some point in their evolution line for Gigantamax Factor. The least complicated of these are Pikachu, Meowth, Lapras, Eevee, Grookey, Scorbunny, Sobble, Rookity, Shoodle, Roly Coly, Silly Cobra, Hatna, Impidimp, and Qfan. The Kanto starters in their first and second stage we counted during the QR segment of the first video, however you'll still need to hunt them in their first stages here as they only spawn unevolved, and we do need to obtain them for the Gigantamax entries. The Kanto starters count for 10 entries altogether with their Gigantamax entries considered, as they would also get their Megaform entries now too. So 3 entries each for Venusaur and Blastoise, and 4 for Charizard since it has 2 Megas. Gengar also counts for 3 entries once it's got Gigantamax Factor, since it too has a Mega Evolution, and we counted Ghastly and Haunter last time, so they can be ignored here. We start to get a little more complicated with Toxel and Applin, as we need to get multiple of each to get all their entries. Both Toxtricity have Gigantamax forms that, despite looking identical, are considered separate entries in Holmes' Pokedex, so we need at least two Toxel. Here's hoping that your two Toxel have the correct natures to evolve into different Toxtricity, because mints don't actually change the nature, just the effect of the nature. Meaning that using one doesn't change what your Toxtricity evolves into. We also need three Applin for this. Only two of them need to be sent back to Sword and Shield, as Flapple and Appleton Gigantamax entries need to be obtained, and yes, they're also considered separate despite looking identical. The third Applin is to evolve into the new DLC evolutions Diplin and Hydrapple in Scarlet and Violet. We'll also need to pick up 9 Shiny Milsuri. You might be questioning why we need specifically 9 Milsuri as opposed to either 7 or 63 of them. It turns out, though, Pokemon Home is an interesting quirk when it comes to Alchemy. Instead of counting it based off either the visual sweets used for the evolution, or just counting the sweet and swirl combinations individually, if you deposit a specific swirl of Alchemy into Pokemon Home, it counts for 7 forms, all 7 of the sweet variations for that swirl of Alchemy. Presumably this is because the swirls the easiest to tell apart visual difference for a non-shiny Alchemy, despite all 63 being burnt black when they're shiny. While it sounds annoying and potentially risky to get the right swirl, since all the swirls look identical when they're shiny, thankfully, if you check the Pokedex after evolving a Milsuri, the swirl that the Alchemy evolved into will have a shiny entry registered there. So you can use that to ensure you got the swirl you were aiming for before you save the game and deposit it into home. If you already had a shiny swirl registered for some reason in-game but not in home, the in-game Pokedex, at least in the Galar games, doesn't register all the sweets at once, so you can use a different suite to verify. Gen 9 doesn't actually do this. Instead, it registers all 7 sweets when you get a given swirl like home does. You can also use the menu sprite to help determine the swirl, but some of them look pretty similar, so be careful if you do that. Remember that one of these Alchemy also needs to be sent back to Sword and Shield to get Gigantamax Factor. No idea why it's only one here instead of all 63 of them, but I'm not complaining. These 9 Milsuri account for 65 entries altogether, which is ridiculous. If you're having a bad day and want a quick boost to your dex total, hunt your first Milsuri and get 9 entries for it, and 7 for each additional Milsuri you get. Dorelodon's probably notable for being one of the most annoying single Pokemon to get all the entries out of. So, Dorelodon has a G-Max form and an evolution in Gen 9 we need to deal with. So after it's caught, you send it back to Sword and Shield, give it mushrooms, and send it back to Evolve, right? Nah, can't be that easy. Turns out, you can't send a Gigantamax-capable Dorelodon into Scarlet and Violet, despite the fact that Dynamax isn't a mechanic in any game it can evolve in, so there's really no reason this should matter. Instead, after you give it mushrooms and deposit it, you have to withdraw it into Sword and Shield again, and waste three more mushrooms on it to get rid of the Gigantamax factor you just gave it, then send it back to Evolve. Or, alternatively, just catch two of them if you have an outbreak and ignore this bullshit. Getting max mushrooms is sort of a pain in the ass on a late game save file anyway, so either approach is valid. Honestly, I'd recommend making a secondary profile on your Switch for Sword or Shield, which you keep in an early game state so it has access to one and two star raids still, and has Isle of Armor access to farm mushrooms on so that they're easier to get. Now for the rest of the Pokémon we're going to pick up here. You're going to want a Coffin to send back a Sword and Shield to evolve into Galarian Weezing, two Galarian Slowpoke to get both of those evolutions, a Cyndaquil to send back to Legends Arceus to become a Hisuian Typhlosion, a Teddy Ursa or Ursarain to evolve into Ursaluna, a Hisuian Quillfish for both the Don Entry and Overquill, 
A Stantler to evolve into Weird Gear, which at this point I feel obligated to mention that despite Stantler and Quillfish having nearly the exact same evolution condition, only Hisui and Quillfish can evolve in Gen 9, and it does so by knowing Bar Barrage. While Stantler, who only gets Psy Shield Bash in Gen 9 as an egg move from Weird Gear, can't evolve here if it knows it. Yeah, that makes sense. Anyway, you'll need an Oshawott to evolve into Hisui and Samurott, a Petalil to evolve into Hisui and Lilligant, two White Stripe Basculin of different genders to evolve into each gender of Basculegion, as they are once again considered alternate forms by home that are actually tracked, a Rufflet to evolve into Hisui and Braviary, Bergmite to evolve into Hisui and Avalog, a Gumi to get the entries for the Hisui and forms of Sligu and Gudra, a Rallo to evolve into Hisui and Decidueye, a Squobit to get it and Greedence entries, Cramorant, which counts for the entries of all three of its forms separately at home, Ericuda to get itself in Barracuda's entries, Phalanx, Pink Urchin, and Snom for itself in Frostmoth, Stonejourner, Ice Q to count for both of its forms, you need both genders of Ingidi, Morpeko will count for both forms when you catch it here, Dreepy to get it, Dracloak, and Dragapult's entries, and finally, a Cleavor, which can spawn in the Terrarium, or you can send a Scyther back to PLA to evolve for it. I don't get why they didn't just allow the evolution to happen in Gen 9 if they're going to make it catchable anyway. Even if you just make it level up near the Black Augurites, but whatever I guess, that's not my decision. We're almost done with the past Gen Mons, but I need to discuss how mass outbreaks work for Pokemon with out of battle form differences for the last two. Because this information is important to not wasting time for them. If a Pokemon has multiple forms, even if the form has no impact on gameplay, a mass outbreak will lock all Pokemon in the outbreak to that form. This is important because it even applies to things like Sinistee, which means if one of them's authentic, they all are. You'll only need to hunt exactly two Sinistees because of this, because you can ensure one of them's gonna be phony and the other will be authentic. The Dunsparce outbreaks are most likely not gonna be very useful to you though, because only two segments of Dunsparce seems to be able to swarm. If I'm wrong on this, please let me know, but as far as I can find, they can only ever be two segments which means you're going to be hunting a lot of Dunsparce still to get that 3-segment entry. Because yes, home treats them separately. I sincerely wish you luck with getting this entry if you don't have access to Gen 4's means of getting it. Whether that be RNG abuse, or synchronizing Poker Radar chains to be hardy. This gets us to 1270 Shinies registered though, once we're done with all the past Gen Mons. On to the Gen 9 Pokemon. The majority of the regular Pokemon in Paldea we won't be talking about, since listing every single wild Pokemon in Paldea would get old real fast. So instead, we're going to talk about any of the ones that are interesting, and which alternate forms count. Paldean Wooper is counted separate from Wooper, of course, but even if it wasn't for some reason, we'd need it for Clodsire. We need all three of the Paldean Tauros variants. We need both genders of Oikolone, because they're counted separately. Thankfully though, a mass outbreak will gender lock all Oikolone in the outbreak. So do Lechonk first, and then do an outbreak for the opposite Oikolone that your Lechonk doesn't evolve into. Unfortunately, Family of Three Mousehold, like Three Segment to Dunsparce, is required. So have fun hunting several Tandemoss until you get lucky, because Mousehold can't swarm at all. Real fun Pokemon to have an almost impossible to distinguish shiny, guys, thanks. All the Squawkabilly colors are required to be caught, as are all three Tatsugiri. Palafin, when deposited, counts for two entries due to its hero form being an in-battle transformation. The last of the notable Gen 9 encounters are Pulchageist and Sinistra. Both the fake and authentic forms are required, like Sinistri, but thankfully, like Sinistri again, both of them can swarm, and their swarms will either be all artisans or all counterfeits. King Gambit, Ferrigiraffe, and Annihilate are all able to swarm in DLC mass outbreaks, so we can skip out on catching a Primate, Giraffe Rig, and Bisharp to evolve. This gives us another 87 regular Paldea Pokemon and 14 forms from Paldea to the total, giving us another 101 Pokemon for 1,371 overall. In addition to the ones we caught in the wild, we need to breed the Paldean starter Pokemon, Sprigatito, Fuecoco, and Quaxley in order to get them in their evolutions, as there's no alternative for them at this time. They count for another 9 Pokemon once they're fully evolved, getting us to 1,380 Shinies registered. Of course, there's still Shiny Locks to talk about in Gen 9 too. All chess Gimmagools in the overworld are shiny lock. I know what you might be thinking about this, but we're coming back to this one later, I promise. That means Goldengo is also locked out from us here, and Roaming Gimmagool isn't even available in the main series. All Gen 9 legendary Pokemon are also shiny locked, including the DLC, which is tradition for new Pokemon games, unfortunately. 
But this time, Game Freak decided to step it up and shiny lock all returning legendaries too. This is very unfortunate for those of you who've wanted to finally shiny hunt Meloetta after all these years, as it means it's still only possible through QR codes. This also means Cubfu, the four forms of Urshifu, Glastrier, and Spectrier are still locked out from us. The Legendary Paradoxes for the Swords of Justice and Legendary Beasts are also shiny locked, as is Blood Moon Ursa Luna. Nearing the end of the challenge is the last game to touch on, being Pokemon Go. It's really easy here, thankfully, as there's only two Pokemon to worry about here, Meltan and Melmetal. These two, in a way, are technically an event, but they're only catchable in Go anyway, and Niantic has a history of making them available regularly. Feel free to count them as the last two non-event Pokemon or the first two event Pokemon. I personally won't be counting them as an event, though I understand why you might disagree with my choice, seeing as they still need an event to spawn. Unfortunately for us, though, regardless of how we feel about Meltan and Melmetal being event Pokemon, a very dumb choice on Game Freak's part is locking us out of the shiny entry for Gigantamax Melmetal completely. For some stupid reason, Melmetal doesn't like Max Soup and refuses to eat it. I know this is a lore thing, because in the anime it only eats metal, but this was definitely just done to make it so they could use the form for an event. That event, being the bonus for depositing a Pokemon from Go into Home, is shiny locked. The other thing about these two is that you can't just get one Meltan. Meltan can't evolve in a main series game as of now, meaning you need to transfer both a Meltan and a Melmetal into Home. So have fun shiny hunting Meltan twice. With the final two Pokémon registered, we're sitting at the final total you can achieve without true event Pokémon at a whopping 1,382 out of 1,446 shiny entries registered. That isn't quite where we're going to stop, of course, though, as we're overachievers here. We now need to discuss a few more Pokémon that can be registered if you're lucky. These first few Pokémon were part of events. Mostly distributions, but not quite all of them. The ones that were distributed and not been made available since are the Galarian Legendary Birds, Zaraara, Zacian, Zamazenta, which both count for two forms because of their crown forms, and Eternatus, which again counts for two because despite not being usable in any game by the player, this also gets us the entry for Eternamax. This is the only way you'll ever see this form shiny without some form of hacking, seeing as your Eternatus can't become Eternamax, and getting the shiny in Sword and Shield doesn't show you shiny Eternamax's entry there to see its model. There are two more to talk about here though, and these two aren't quite distributions, and in fact, just evil. There was a raid event which ran from June 21st to July 2nd of 2023, which put chest form Gimmigul in raids. This is the only time Gimmigul hasn't been shiny locked, and it didn't have any form of boosted odds. That's right, a limited time raid event, where for each Gimmigul raid you participate in, is a 1 in 4096 chance of being shiny. And it was only for a week and a half. Yeah, talk about the worst way to release any shiny ever. I'm not usually one to complain about bad shiny colors either, but I'm sorry. This difference being nearly non-existent on both it and Goldango is insulting, seeing as the only way to get it is debatably the single worst of all time. I'm speaking as someone who is grateful to have been let into a couple of people's raids once they found it for themselves, so I have both of these two sitting at home for anyone I know personally who might ever want the entries. That tangent aside, though, Roaming Gimmigul is still not available shiny by any means, which means that with the event Pokémon added, we're at the final total one can get today, at 1,394 out of 1,446 shinies registered. That leaves 52 Pokémon who are currently impossible to register, so why don't we go over them all together at the end here. We just discussed Roaming Gimmigul, but the other Pokémon which you can't currently register are the other 7 Cat Pikachus, that being all of them but Partner Cat, Cosmog, Cosmoem, the two forms of Agirna, Marsh Shadow, Gigantamax Melmetal, Cubfu, the two Urshifu and their Gigantamax forms, and no, the shiny Gigantamax Urshifu raids that came as a result of the first day of that one raid event having no shiny lock don't register in home because they weren't catchable, the two Zaruds, Glastrier, Spectrier, the three Calyrex forms, Blood Moon Ursa Luna, the two forms of Enamorous, the legendary treasures, Coridon, Moridon, which would both only count for one each, despite the unused Pokedex entries in Scarlet and Violet for each of their ride transformation states, the Legendary Paradoxes, the Loyal Three, the four forms of Ogre Pond, the three forms of Terrapagos, and finally, Petrawunt. You might notice I said currently impossible to register, and not just impossible to register. 
I mentioned at the start of part 1 that I wanted to discuss a glitch that caused me to unintentionally get 5 more entries than I was supposed to. This glitch was patched out of Pokemon Home long ago, so unfortunately you can't do this today, but it all comes back to one entry we skipped in Kalos in part 1. Eternal Flower Floet. Pokemon Home at launch really didn't like it when you tried to transfer this Pokedex entry into it, since the entry didn't actually exist in Pokemon Home since the form is unreleased. So if you connected to a Pokemon bank, which already had this entry registered as caught, which would happen if you scanned the QR for this Pokemon, while having any Floet registered as caught in Pokemon Bank, it would cause absolute chaos in the Pokedexes for your home account. And it didn't even unlock the same entries across both versions. I've seen some people claim that this one entry finished the entire Pokedex for them in Pokemon Home, but for me personally, what it seemed to do was add a ton of random shiny entries that I don't even have in Bank. The most notable of them, being all but one of the Gen 7 Cat Pikachu being registered as Shiny. The only one it seems to have missed was Kanto Cat Pikachu. I know for a fact it resulted in more than that though, as I connected it to my friend's home account in Pokemon Bank later on to do a transfer and see if it was patched, and I notably remembered that only one of the two Hoopa entries was there as a Shiny. Of course, I also mentioned in Part 1 that an entry I have on mobile is missing on Switch too. That entry is Hoenn Cat Pikachu, which of course I can't fix because Cat Pikachu are actually coded to be ignored by the currently able to be generated Type 3 Pokedex QR codes. As a result of this glitch though, the maximum total that I can confirm exists on the mobile version of Pokemon Home that this challenge was based off is a very unsatisfying 1399 out of 1446 shiny entries. I have no reason to believe though that Kanto Cat Pikachu Cosmog, Cosmoam, Magirna's two forms, and Marshadow couldn't have been registered by this glitch. But seeing as I didn't get them, I can't really confirm that either way now, can I? Based off the research in the recent update video I did, and looking at all the QR codes that were released with the other types, I'm pretty sure they're all possible through QR codes for types other than Type 3. However, we don't have a private key that can generate any of the other types, and probably never will unless someone decides to brute force the key, or brute force the QR codes themselves. If you want to count these theoretically possible Pokemon as well, the total is 1405 out of 1446 that are possible to register on Pokemon Home as shiny Pokemon. I'd like to thank you all for watching and being patient with me on getting this video out. I know it took quite a while, but I wanted to make sure the information was formatted as well as I can make it for anyone who might want to go through this journey themselves. I also didn't want to immediately make this video outdated by figuring out the last Gen 7 QRs like a day later after I posted or something. I tried everything I could think of before coming to the conclusion that I did for those last few Pokemon, and that's a significant reason that this video took so long to release. For anyone who decides that they want to torture themselves with this challenge, I wish you luck, and for the rest of you, I hope that this mini-series was interesting. These have been easily the two videos I put the most effort into on this channel so far, so I hope that they were enjoyable. The channel's been doing fairly well recently despite my slow upload speed, and I certainly appreciate it. I'm jumping between a billion projects right now, and this channel's mostly just another hobby for me at the moment, which is why I tend to take my time between uploads. I really don't like asking for subs or likes, but for those of you who have been liking my content and don't want to miss the next upload, feel free to subscribe and hit the bell icon, as I'm fairly certain YouTube doesn't typically promote channels that are slow to push stuff out, or push stuff very inconsistently like mine does. I'd also like to give a big shout out to my good friend Altissimo for writing up a list of every single form in Pokemon Home in a spreadsheet for me to use to track the Pokemon in this part more effectively. As I was continuously running into issues with Pokemon being missing or counting a Pokemon twice in the total before she ended up doing that for me. And I feel like this video would have taken like another month to come out if she hadn't done this for me. I left a slightly edited copy of this list in the description that I've turned into a super basic checklist. This checklist is just a list of each form name that's in Pokemon Home, with a box to check for it if you have a regular version, and a box to check if you have a shiny version registered, and it tells you your totals for each of them. It's not super polished or anything, and I'm not sure if I intend to do anything more with it, but since Home doesn't let you filter by shinies unregistered, I figured this might help at least one person out there. To use it, all you need to do is make a copy of it from the file menu of Google Sheets, and check off whichever ones you have. I'd like to thank you all again so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time, because I've got some other cool topics I want to research and discuss in the near future. Later on, Buzz!